Good evening. I'm Jennifer Brown, director of the Center for Literary Arts at Frostburg State University. Welcome to this evening's reading by Edward Doyle Gillespie. Before I introduce Ed, I'd like to express my gratitude to all of those organizations that make the work of the Center for Literary Arts possible. The Maryland State Arts Council, the Allegheny Arts Council, the Community Trust Foundation, the City of Frostburg, and several offices at Frostburg State University, including the Office of the President, the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and the Department of English and Foreign Languages and Literature. Edward Doyle Gillespie is a longtime Baltimore resident. A police detective and instructor at the Baltimore Police Academy, he holds a degree in history from George Washington University and an MLA from Johns Hopkins University. He's the author of five books of poetry, one of which is forthcoming in February, and we're grateful to have him along with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Edward Doyle Gillespie. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate being here. Um, as I listened to everything you said going in, just I, I just my heart kind of soared. This has been this is very up, uplifting for me. This has all been it's been a trying time for all of us. I know, and so um, literature is one of those things that now pulls me through. So thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, I'm a big advocate, I have to be honest, of the whole that whole idea of killing the author. You know, um, so you know, what does this story mean to you? What does this poem mean to you? You know, if you were to take out the author. So I did an experiment with my own work, and um, I said, so if I were uh, approaching my work as someone who is not me. Um, what would I make of it? What would I think? And I was particularly interested in the issue of biography, first of all, and then that versus persona created by the poet. Uh, I think those are two of the most interesting dynamics that take place in literature. Uh, a lot of the poets that influence me um, do, they influence me a lot because of that. I'm thinking particularly of Sylvia Plath. Um, and Anne Sexton. Uh, so I thought, okay, if I'm looking at the poetry of a police officer, what do I see that is directly, like almost like a chronicle of what that officer has seen and done? And then where does that officer create persona? And then I looked at another, I kind of looked, thought of them as concentric circles as I get farther out. How does persona link to place in some ways? Because place is often very important for officers. Um, so I just kind of want to take us on a, little journey with this. And I'm in doing that, I'm going to try to introduce you to some of the stuff that has been chronicled by this poet. <laughs> um, my, uh, this one book of mine, Masala Tea and Oranges, uh, is one of, it's my first book. And this is a poem from that book, from that collection called Final Hodge. So, you know, the Hajj is the, uh, the trip that many Muslims, faithful Muslims take to Saudi Arabia. Final Hodge. When the call to prayer goes out from the mosque on Islamic way, I am helping to load Tavon Fitzgerald into the back of Medic 4. He has only a small hole from the girl's kitchen knife over his heart, but his body will erupt with a raspberry tide when the residents down at Maryland General crack his chest to practice the alchemy of resurrection. They will fail unable to make the quick out of the dead, and I will gather his clothes, baggy layers of ghetto soldier uniform, heavy with blood, and document them on a police form 56. I will wrap the chain of his Zodiac medallion around his butane lighter and stuff them into the smallest of the evidence envelopes. I will shake the clots loose from his ragged sweatshirt as I give it to the next red plastic bag in the pile. I will change my gloves three times and wonder whether he was distracted at that last moment by the loudspeaker reminding him that God is great. So that uh, I based on a, um, a homicide uh, that I witnessed. Uh, he, he had been stabbed already when I got there and the last thing he did was look me right in the eye as I was running towards him. I was running, I was calling on my radio, and he looked me in the eye and took this 
terminal breath. And so I watched him from his last moment to when, as I described, they broke, they cracked his chest. The wound had been tamponade at the scene. Uh, so it was, there was no actual blood coming out of him. When they cracked his chest, everything was spilled out. And so that image rides with me still. Um, and that's, so some of these right now I'm looking at are bi biographical. They're things I've actually witnessed, um, seen. Uh, this is from my book, Aerial Act. Um, it's called The Folklore of Sun Showers. If anyone's familiar with the concept of sun, sun showers, this is when it's both the sun is out and it's raining at the same time. So there was a devil's rain falling on the day that you asked me to kill you. I want to say that you begged me to do it, but that would be unfair. That would be me playing dramatic, free and loose with you. I want to say that you came to me on one supplicant knee, St. Francis of the alleyway, weary of your hypodermic stigmata and that the only saving grace left in your world lay in the chamber of my automatic. But that would be a lie again. You spoke to me with the calm voice of a supplicant who realized after this chase down the alleyway, he had grown ready e enough to simply ask, could you put one behind my ear, officer? Ain't nobody gonna care, officer. And the sun was shining and I could see my re reflection in the tribulation of the puddles. As a downpour drenched us both, fractured the sunlight and threatened to wash this city away. You know, that was one of two times someone asked me to kill them. Um, a person who was uh, struggling with drug addiction said, you know, no one's really going to care. You know, just do me a favor. Could you just execute me here? You know, and um, many officers become bereft of empathy um, because of the traumas that they experience. And uh, things like that can either drive you deeper into that well or kind of shock you awake. You know, I think that did a lot to clue me that I was dealing with human beings, you know. Um, on this, in the same book, I have one called On the Giraffe Man. On the, on the Giraffe Man. When we cut him down that day in the middle of summer, we called him the, the Giraffe Man. You see, he'd hung like that swaying in the basement bathroom for such a long time with his feet seeking gravity and his body pulled to the center of the earth. We called him that because his broken neck grew brave and grew long while, we wait, while he waited for us to come and cut him down. We called him that because now in the leaking moldy shadows of that underground room, he was finally quiet, finally still. And as far as any of us knew, the tallest man in the world. So it's not uncommon that a suicide will let and stay there for so long, the neck will stretch out. Um, I realized, um, someone said to me once, you know, you should keep a journal as you do police work and just write down everything that happens to you. And I've tried to do that with, with fiction, but there was so much you meet so many people, so many things happen that I actually found that poetry, the brevity of poetry distills these incidents. Um, so this is from another one of my books. Um, it's called On the Later Edition of Sancho Panza, long title. Um, this is called Sus Suspended, Suspended. The guy is a, a prison Muslim, gray bearded, and dying of prostate cancer. He drove up here from Virginia in a battered white Honda that a, a mosque brother gave him. And I pulled him over for the missing lights, the reek of gas and rubber, the jigsaw of glass that should have been a, a rear window. His eyes were shuttered halfway as he calls me, Mr. Officer, from behind the wheel and admits he hasn't had a license in five years. This trip, he thought, would give him something to do while he waited. He is sorry about the car and the mess he made. He doesn't want me to think the worst of him. So 
looking at my biographical pieces, I realized um, they were cathartic and very therapeutic for me in terms of humanizing the experiences I was going through. Um, this um, is about a person who served as a confidential informant, actually. Um, it's called Jess. We are below the shattered row house, the creeping vine row house that keeps watch over North Avenue like an opiate mother nodding slowly, arching slowly over a newly empty crib. We are below the shattered row home that is turning green with that ivy that urgently comes to live in the broken places of Penn North. And she is telling me that she can smell soul food from Mel's, can smell lake trout and white bread that soaks up the grease from a block away. This is the same row house shadow just days ago in which she talked about the old guy who asked how much he, extra he had to pay to slap her, how much extra he had to pay to slap a white girl with his thick crooked hand because he wanted to see a good bruise like an open palm signature that would swallow her whole face. And the redness is less now and her hands are swollen now. She is asking me if I can smell the grease of the sizzling fish and if I can hear the boys calling out a block away and how long I think it will take for the verdant fingers to completely enshroud this empty weeping house. Um, part of that too was about place, obviously. It was about um, what I think has become a, almost a frontier uh, and the ethic of people that live, many of the people that live there trying to maintain a sense of humanity as they live in a place that's in some cases neither here nor there, you know. Um, so in addition to looking at straightforward biography, like this is the writer's experience where does that feed into persona, they ask, you know, I mean, so you become an actor in a way when you write, when you, you know, a poet when you write. Um, so where do you create a character or a voice that's influenced by yours, but not necessarily directly drawn from it? Um, so, and of course, every police officer is a human being, right? So you're talking about you're talking about a, a multi-dimensional being. You're talking about a, a, a character made up of characters, made up of characters. And so um, I think this one spoke a lot to my ideas about being educated as to being a, a man. Um, this is called Queensberry Rules. This is in uh, Masala Tea and Oranges. Queensberry Rules. My father taught me how to box. He said it was once a gentleman's sport a manly art meted out in the half light of our garage. He said I could use it to defend myself. I can still feel the cold burning in the back of my throat and my spit turning to a gray paste at the corners of my mouth as he showed me how to hammer a rhythm on the ragged cast off bag from the Druid Hill Avenue Y. He told me to strike it as if the canvas was hot, snapping my meager fists back as I jabbed and crossed at the indifference of the sack. As our labored breath formed clouds and coils in the air, my father told me to keep my hands up, to breathe through my nose, and to always, always guard my face. So I, um, my father didn't teach me how to box, but I do box. <laughs> I do martial arts. Um, and so a lot of the imagery of martial arts has fed its way into the writing that I've done um, because there's always something about struggle involved in it. Um, struggle and trying to distill what's going on at any given moment in life. This is called a cut across the body, a cut across the body. Now, while you sleep, I remember my first sensei telling me about how the prisoners of samurai, when it was clear that the gleaming steel of a new sword would be tested on them, would sometimes eat rocks, a, a stone or two, 
maybe a handful of gravel, just to damage the craftsman's work as it opened them up, just to ruin the soul of a perfect straight edge. It was um, a practice in Okinawa, actually. It was not uncommon to, for samurai to use what's called the case cut, to slice a person, to see if they can slice a, a human being in half with the, uh, their samurai swords. So that kind of, the idea of persona then leads us back around in many cases to place, I think, that we create a persona. That persona exists because it is from or existing in a certain place, a certain dynamic. So that then leads me back around to an understanding of where I've existed, where this writer has existed as a police officer, as a man. and. Um, I'll say that I have a great interest in the uh, macabre and um, in the supernatural. And I think that folklore and mythology and supernatural stories, they are a great way to distill the, our human existence, to, to distill our fears, and our interests and our concerns. And so this one is called Cold. Um, cold. If you see him in your living room hunched over, or shuddering and chattering as his knee as he kneels outside your child's bedroom, matching her breathing with his moans and dying sobs. Tell him that you are sorry. If he forms himself into a ball at the end of your your hall, when you pad barefoot up the stairs on a midsummer night, tell him that you live here now. It it no longer rains through the, the ceiling or crusts over with ice when winter rolls down on us. Tell him that it is warm here now. Tell him that a person's breath no longer clings to the air in this place. And that when the workmen found him, homeless and stiff in the basement of this empty, newly bought Baltimore Row house, you wept. Um, I've had more than one case, cases of homeless people being found um, frozen to death in, um, the basements of homes are being renovated. So what if they stayed around, right? Um, so another journey for me has been um, coming to realize, and this is, not, this is something that was kind of obfuscated in my family, that uh, we are actually of Cuban descent, that my grandfather is an immigrant from Cuba. And... Um, his name was Jorge, he changed it to George, his Manuel simply became an M. And um, I had a moment in the Dominican Republic uh, two years ago that kind of spoke to that. Because now there's this whole hidden narrative in the family. I'm still, this is a whole other story. But um, this, uh, in my book, Aerial Act, um, oops, came to mind. When the, the tourists come, for a moment, there is a small brown man weaving his way through the veins of the marketplace. He wears the straw fit fedora of old Latin men, and he tosses back a sample shot of the rum that is meant for the tourists and for the rich that live behind the white villa walls. He walks with the graceful fury of the abuelos, moving in between a boxer's shuffle and a soldier's promenade, making demands of the earth until he stops for a moment and watches the guitar curves of your body. You are searching for our souvenir trophies. And when your arms are full of woven dolls and lacquer ashtrays, and you're going to the counter to pay, he looks to me and says a word in Spanish that is lost in the gentle leeward winds. I flail furiously trying to clutch at the fluttered pieces and sew them together before he can use the magic of old Latin men and disappear like smoke in the Caribbean heat. Um, so um, the connection of people to place is uh, something that um, kind of grew for me, excuse me, <laughs> kind of grew for me um, into uh, an interest in uh, magical realism. Um, so I've done some experimentation with that as well. There's, um, so always going back to what am I trying to dig out about the writer, about you know, where I'm, 
the, the individual who's actually putting pen to paper? How is it connected to place? And what role does mythology play in it? What role does mythology, what role does magic play? What role does something unseen or intangible play here? Um, so going along those same myths of the, um, the hidden heritage, I call it, uh, I did a writer's workshop, writer's residency in um, Miami uh, back in last, about a year ago now, actually, yeah, it was a year ago, and uh, came up with a set of poems that became the nexus of um, Gentrifying the Plague House, which is my fifth book, which is forth forthcoming in uh, February. This is called uh, Creation Myth in One Day. There are Cuban men in the lobby now. They have come in the height of the heat of the day in dark designer suits and open collars. They have come to play chess, teaching leaps and slanted lines to young girlfriends, talking to the Haitian woman who brews the coffee, coolly racing from the cigar shop around the corner to the library chill of this marble hotel. And when the sun is swallowed up, new ones rise out of the at Atlantic out of the beaches raked sand they wear the white pants of cane cutters de deliberately out at the knee embracing conga drums with sinewy legs as they sit beside the lobby door yeah. as i ply the haitian woman for another cup they thrum the taut hides of their drums and they wail their words because the songs are ancient loves circles drawn in sand and an ocean full of dancing bones So um, I had a moment very tied to place there, um, a moment of self-revelation, <laughs> almost. The same one, coming back to Baltimore, um, I hope I'm not, hope I'm not bomb bombarding you with too much here. <laughs> um, coming back to Baltimore and bringing the idea of myth and magic with us, I've always been fascinated by the character Lilith, by the Midrashic um, story of, of Lilith and how, when I read that story, I was so identified. I mean, if thinking about a female archetype, I mean, you obviously, you know, as a woman, you'll see a male archetype, as a man, a woman, like I identify with that, you know, that female archetype speaks to me. Um, and, you know, actually, especially as coming from a person, it's not a person of faith. I don't come from a faith tradition, um, so I can kind of take it all in and, and you know make of it what I what I will. Saying, well, what, why didn't this story make the cut? You know, um, this character is much more interesting. I could get behind this one. So um, I've always, you know, I, I wrote a short story about Lilith actually at one point that you know she's still hanging around and she talks to Kane and goes to tattoo parlors and drinks whiskey and and so um, I um, <clears throat> this came up for me. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, downtown Baltimore. Lilith in transit. I saw one of Rossetti's stunners on the bus this morning. I'm pretty sure it was Lilith, but don't hold me to that. I mean, she had those corn forth lips and she was brushing her hair, admiring her reflection in the mullion's fractured steel, but I could be wrong. I folded my paper, slumped in my seat, and watched my commuter Lilith preen her thick red curls as we shuddered past Holiday Street and the old boarded up porno shop. Over her shoulder, I could see the place where Clara used to dance on her pole. And I swear the blind man on the corner of President and, and Baltimore, doomsday soothsayer with his all seeing eye dog hailed her as we passed. But my Lilith incendiary in her, her affliction t-shirt to rose up only twisted her hair and those tortoise shell coils, pursed her lips, and waited for the next stop to arrive. Um, I've, I've had fun with that character um, <laughs> over time. I've been doing short stories and you know, because she's empowered. I love it. <laughs> um, that same, same lines, I... Uh, I saw a photograph, once again, these ideas of female em em empowerment. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of taking us on a, a trail here of, you know, biography, which is direct to persona, which is influenced, and then 
adding in the concepts of place, which is still something concrete, and then almost the semiotics of the place that there's like, you know, that unseen magic or the, the you know, the elements we add to it. Um, this is called Bruja, which is um, in many Latino cultures is a, a witch. Something. I asked her to cast the, the, the spell again, this time closer to home, and she did. Instead of recreating the London Bistro for me, she chose the abandoned storefront six blocks down, the one we passed during our Sunday walks. We heard it was a, a furniture store once, and then a place for Leviticus voodoo and holy roller magic. Now, bare metal tendrils reach down from the ceiling's dark gate, glistening, glinting at us through the fractured picture window. She, she closed her eyes, breathed in deep. She conjured a marble bar because I loved that so much the last time. The brass rails, the color of honey. She curved the night up like her in a red dress with curls sweeping and Sachmo's version of Mac the Knife piped in Deo, Deus Ex Machina. And me? For me, she materialized the smoldering body of a thick brown Cuban cigar between my index and middle fingers. She decided I would wear the same blue blazer, but my shirt would be open at the collar. As I blew life into the, the smolder and the reek, she leaned against the doorway behind me. She leaned like a teacher down beside me as the gloaming poured itself through the wide window. And she asked me whether this was exactly what I meant. So, we can learn a lot about ourselves in these distilled moments. So this is my place, this is my time, right? This is my energy. And I'm feeling a lot of that now with autumn being here. Like I, I can kind of exist through summer, but autumn is where I really become expressive and really enjoy myself. So, <clears throat> so I did another book, uh, Socorro Prophecy. Now I, I, I like the word prophecy and prophesy, which is the, the verb form. So, and I'm, as I looked at them more, I found the references that they're kind of becoming interchangeable. And so I said, well, let me use the, the fluidity of that in this title. So it could be Socorro Prophesy or Prophecy. <laughs> um, So this is another piece about policing in Baltimore, um, where I was kind of a student. I listened to an older officer talk about this and um, pulled this together. This is called Skipping Girl. Dedicated to the Murphy Holmes Housing Project, Baltimore, Maryland. They say that she skips rope in an empty lot down by Martin Luther King Boulevard down where the Murphy homes used to brood over vacant homes and wino sidewalk eulogies. That's where she still keeps a rhythm in the dark. They say she wears the frilly white hand-me-downs and saddle shoes that she wore to church on the day she disappeared. And she has lost one of the plastic barrettes that held a pigtail in place. One of the cops on midnight shifts says that he see, he's seen her playing in the weeds and garbage where they found her tiny body flayed open all those years ago. There's an old Araber who says that his horse gets spooked down around there because she loved animals and still tries to stroke its hide and ring its bell. Everyone says that when the sirens fade away and the boombox parties wind down in the projects, you can hear a baby falsetto chanting a double Dutch rhythm and answering the call of a strange man in a plain white van. Um, I I, uh, I don't know how much I believe in spirits, but I do think that trauma is very much a part of any given place. And um, Baltimore holds a lot of trauma, less like a physical body can hold it, right? So likewise, I uh, thinking about 
persona at a place in time, how does any given place in time, as much as physical space, create that persona? All right. So would a character still be the same character in a different time? What, you know, what is it about that pivotal moment that creates who that person is? Um, this is called Gabriel. A, a girl in third platoon had the phrase, God is my warrior across her back in Hebrew. She was from Brooklyn, they said, and she had it done in, the basement, in a basement tattoo parlor while the smoke was still rising from ground zero. She cursed as the needle hummed harshly against the sharp landscape of her shoulder blades and wondered aloud whether she should become a cop or a soldier or go to Israel and become one of those tough chicks in green berets she saw on, on the news. She took up her tan, she, it took up her tan shoulders and was raised like scars to the touch. Its Gothic letters were big and dark and they ripped and fell apart along with the rest of her when the shrapnel came whistling in that night in Tikrit. We'd gone off without the plates for our vests and the empty pockets invited hot chunks of Russian made steel to tattoo her one last time, drive the blood from her body and strangle the words that would protect her. Um, I wanna make sure I still leave some time for us to get some, some great, okay, great, okay. <laughs> some conversation, great. Um, So go back to an aerial act. And uh, this is called, so this is, this is a big, this is a question raised about uh, who are we in relative to, to the others in our lives, right? As I look at what creates me, what, what is the, but the piece, the building blocks, obviously a big part of it is who I am relative to friends and family and you know, the people around me. This is called On the Merits of a Gleaned Pomegranate. The summer that I finally came home, we sat in your kitchen and you taught me how to eat a, a pomegranate. You had collected three of them from the women who had collected all of them from the cast offs of the market that now stood where I only remember an empty lot. He brought them for nothing from the women who, you think, spoke Portuguese as they hauled box after box of broken, ugly fruit from the rusted bed of an ancient pickup truck. You told me that you cannot peel a, a pomegranate or let your blood, or let your blade have a dalliance with a thick ruby hide. You must cleave it straight through, you showed me and scoop out the gleaming pulp like the gore of an open wound. So I listened, my leg wrapped around the chair's leg, and I cursed the river and the promises made in serpentine words that have kept me away for so damn long. I think um, going along with that, right after it uh again how you're tied to others how we're tied to others and um this was uh inspired by a friend of mine who had a double mastectomy um and it was very interesting to me that she said no it's just time it's time for me to do this so i can keep myself healthy and so it's kind of fascinating to me um of of mortal scarring i found you again on the cool side of my pillow still bound like, Pro like Prometheus to the mountain town. I pictured you taking a deep breath of the icy air that battered the steam of your coffee and pushed back the gray forelocks of your hair. <clears throat> Clouds rolled over the ragged ridgeline like punch drunk brawlers tumbling on the floor of the sawdust bar in the middle of, of town. And you told me that you wanted to road trip to the university hospital so many miles away. It was time, you said, because the women in your family no longer waited for the rebellious cells that ate your grandmothers and your great grandmothers alive. I flipped the pillow again, alone in my bed, to find you laughing that it was time to offer tributes to high priests with gleaming knives 
that would cut you as clean as an Amazon who can fire her bow with either hand. As a, as a man engaging with that, I was kind of in awe of um, the strength, really. I mean, the power and the strength I see in, in lots of the women in my life. Um, I was absolutely fascinated by that. Um, I was a history major, I was a history major, and uh, I've done a lot of work, particularly was interested in US social history. So I've done work on um, the civil rights movement and slavery and uh, the different social social strata, social dynamics that make up the United States. Um, I was always interested in the role of rivers in a lot of those social dynamics, rivers as a means of escape, rivers as a means of punishment, rivers as a means of nourishment um, in the American South. And um, so I came up with this. The river had a, a, a part in it. The river had a part in it. The river introduced them one to the other. It took, it took communion from them, took them apart as it would topsoil after a rain and washed their stories downstream. This was how they knew one another when the time for leaving came. This was how the one who had been broken with the ax handles folded and packed away in the dirt of the earthen dam for speaking out of turn, heard the story of the child who was weighted down with a cotton gin wheel and tossed from a skiff the old men used for fishing. The river introduced them and was gracious and kind as it mingled them because this was the South and no one should travel alone through the weeping of the gulf, the blindness of the mud, and out to the freedom of the ocean's salt. Um, I was particularly um, struck by the story of Emmett Till and the fact that his body was thrown into a, you know, a uh, river. And um, also Schroener, Cheney, and Goodman and the fact that when uh, as they were searching for Schroener, Cheney, and Goodman who were finally found in a riverbank in an embankment, I think like a dozen other people were found a dozen other bodies were found uh, as they dug through riverbanks and, and streams and fields and things like that. There were murdered victims all over the place. And um, Emmett Till's, the, the plaques that commemorate Emmett Till's um, murder, like, you know, here's where he was picked up, here's where he was murdered, here's where his body was found. They're regularly shot up. Um, people regularly shoot them with assault rifles and um, shotguns and pistols. Um, so thinking in terms of how we're tied to others. I mean, these are, you know, it's funny, um, Barbara Kingsolver said that uh, every, I, I saw a talk with her and she said, you know, every writer that you've been has a right to exist. Um, and uh, I appreciate her saying that because I've looked at some stuff I had published in journals like 20 years ago and thought, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? <laughs> but um, I realized as I look through these, and it's interesting going through these most recent pieces, these books, that it, it comes down a lot to how do I interface with people? How do I grow? Who do I become with the people with whom I interface? How do I interface with places? What do I leave behind? What do I take with me? Um, I found that scarring and tattooing and changes in the body are really important because, again, it's a, it's a type of chronicle. And um, it's not uncommon, once again, taking it back to my policing, uh, the culture of policing, which I've done for 15 years now, for us to sit around and sort of find ourselves in conversations about how maimed we, how maimed we are. Um, that, I mean, just physically, first of all, like, you know, whose knees have been reconstructed, who's been shot, who's been stabbed. Um, you know, I've personally been hit by cars a few times. Didn't really care for that much. But um, I um, talked to an officer just uh, yesterday who had a tattoo that said not today on it and had a date and he said yeah that's the date I was shot and he said that was I see it decided he said I that was not the day I was going to die um so I know officers carrying shrapnel and bullet wounds bullets and things like that around in them um and that's so thinking a lot about what's written on the body 
gets me into a conversation, gets me into a narrative about how we relate, how I relate to my body, how I relate to those, the bodies of the people around me, whether I expect them to be able to back me up with them or communicate with me um, with their bodies and things like that. So it's interesting that as a police officer can become very cold and very hardened, but at the same time, there's a certain intimacy that you, you have, you know, all of the wounds and the pain and the trauma that the other people around you carry in them. You know, when you arrest people, even you put your hands on them, you hold them, you cuff them, you, you know. Um, and so um, this, uh, this comes up to, you know, when you get to that other side of your life and you're still relating to the body. It's called these, these rights. In the morning, when you are draped across the bed, Long, pale, black curls in a heap, white sheets almost disappearing into your flesh. I begin to read the places that I hadn't reached the night before. I taste your thigh, Botticelli thigh with freckles, your heels, the small of your back, the place behind your knee. I draw my forefinger's dented tip along the scars on your leg, the place where Gretchen Matthews slammed you with a rock in the seventh grade and the stitches that ended your high school basketball career. I kiss the places where your open-toed slingbacks rub you raw, making you hobble, twist and curse in your treks across campus. I kiss the red lash marks left by the underwire of your bra. And maybe I'll light my last camel with these matches that you pocketed at the top of the World Cafe last night. I'll blow smoke across your body like an Amazon shaman in a healing rite, trying to cleanse you of your last lover, the one that taught you Indrani, taught you the sporting of the sparrow, gave you your penchant for screaming, for biting, for cheap red wine in these sad, dark roadside motels. You're doing time wise. <laughs> But two more. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, I've I'm surrounded by, like I said, a lot of traumatized people, people with narratives about conflict and war and violence written in their bodies. Make sure I'm still there. <laughs> um, this is called the the the, the shrapnel men. The shrapnel men. While the 4th of July finally died in our backyard that year, the shrapnel men gathered to drink below my mother's hanging garden. It had become dense, heavy nighttime, the air hazy with burnt out fireworks and the acrid leavings of a charcoal conflagration, and the shrapnel men were drinking. They were brown bottle men, matted to the darkness, who sank into ragged palms of backyard chairs and no, that no longer kept firm hold over curses and oaths made to Highland, central Highland ghosts. And I would listen, my back against the broken spine of our neighbor's wooden fence, knowing that the black sizzled fat that clung to the grill would still be there next summer to season raw slabs of wounded flesh when the coals grew glowing hot and the sky was again on fire. Let's do uh, one more from the new collection. All right. So uh, they said I'm in kind of a cultural wrestling match with my family. Um, <laughs> so family's always great for writing. Um, so this is called Excluding the Coldness of My Room and the Strange Ways of Fathers. When I write this, I will say that the house was narrow and that it overflowed with books whose backs were broken by the hands of old men. I will say that he spoke to me in so many languages that my teachers feared for the sanity of my tongue. In my story, you bickered with him using the immigrant mouths of our grandparents because the things of which you spoke were only the business of, a, of adults. I will write that you took me into the cauldron of our kitchen along with my sister and the aunties of your, your coven. Garlic would cleanse, I will say you said, and red wine forgive if you forget to find it the coolest recesses of the house. 
I will write that you were working with the crank of an ancient grinder or even a mortar and, and pestle when you explained to me that, pa that pa paprika could be almost tasteless if done the wrong way. If you did not crush the right pepper in the right way, it would give you its color, maybe a trail of its scent. But when you went to meet it, its flavor would only be a ghost haunting whatever was meant to be your sustenance. Thank you. Oh, Ed, thank you so much. Uh, so, that's such a delight to hear you read. Um, we you. do have uh, a, a few comments uh, just in the chat on YouTube. Uh, Deborah Briggs says, always great to hear Ed's poetry. So true. Uh -huh. um, and Timothy Joseph Ward uh, writes, Ed, so happy I got here to hear a bit. Um, but so far we don't have questions. <laughs> okay. Um, but I am curious about the title of your new collection, uh, Gentrifying the Plague House. You, you told me before that you came up with that title before the pandemic. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that kind of blew my mind. Um, so, I mean, again, I'm just, I'm interested. And this is not to get into like a, a preternatural sort of a discussion, but it's just um, how we come into spaces and kind of try to make them our own and obliterate what they've done, what they have, what's taken place there, whether it's a matter of someone's trauma, someone's joy, whether it's a matter of literally, I mean, this has been, a, this was someone's dying place. I mean, when you've gone into homes that are being renovated and someone's been executed in them and someone's going to live here now, right? Now, you know, it's, some people will go to, well, there's a spirit might be there, or, but just the idea that we have to remember are several interlocking narratives take place in space. So when we gentrify a space, and I mean, I think we always like to make that, well, you know, well-to-do white people coming into a neighborhood of color and taking over, but, you know, gentrification can mean a lot of things, I think, you know, when you're changing one culture to another. And yeah, the, pl <laughs> the plague house. So I, I thought like, so what if, you know, you had a space with the Spanish influenza, for instance, had taken place and there was nothing joyful about this place, you know, when we go to gentrify it, when we go to bring our civilization into it, when we go to bring our thinking and our culture and our ways into it, do we remember what this place has meant? How do we incorporate what this place has meant? How do we honor it? It's, it's almost like, um, I've probably heard the cases of in New York, at least ha at least once, where you had a, a skyscraper being built and as they're digging the foundation, like, oh my gosh, they're bones. What's with all these bones? At first they thought it was a mafia graveyard and it turns out this was a slave burial ground. Okay, so even if you don't believe that there are spirits there or anything, it's like, how do we rehumanize ourselves and rehumanize our society by saying, you know what, let's not forget the horrible trauma that must have taken place here versus, hey, we got this great shiny new building, just get this stuff out of the way, you know? And yes, it was, I wrote it back in October. So, I mean, the coronavirus was somewhere in the peripheries of my, you know, thinking, and it was in Florida of all places, you know. Um, but yeah, it's it was it struck me um, a bit of serendipity there that yes, uh, my idea about and you know we have to think what will what will masks mean in the future? What will you know the word quarantine mean in the future? You know, after saying that my daughter's in Generation Zoom, so. <laughs> Um, so that, that title kind of pulled itself together on its own and um, has become quite apropos. <laughs> well, so on a related subject, uh, we do have a question uh, asking if you could talk some about your forthcoming book, right? We just discussed the title, yeah. um, but as far as the, the poems themselves, maybe if you could say something about the collection, the way it hangs together. Sure. Um, I think this was my venture into a bit of magical realism, which is something I've always liked. Um, Gabriel Garcia, Mar Garcia Mar Marquez is just like a very welcoming, I mean, whenever I read his work, it's very welcoming to me. Um, the, the, the voice is just very warm and old and the, the handling of the idea of magic is, is very, I mean, I, I like the idea that it's just preternatural and fascinating, but it also gets to the parts of life that we can't really put our hands on. So I think that's a big part of this collection that, you know, there's a power here that I just can't really control. Um, so that's that's one thing. 
Uh, I think this collection is a lot about cultures meeting one another, you know, and not necessarily one overwhelming the other, but what happens when cultures rub up against one another, when they see one another from afar, um, when they look at the remnants of the other, that's one thing I find really fascinating that when you look at, well, this is what's left of that culture, what's left of those people. Um, I think that comes up in it a lot. Uh, that kind of takes me back to that whole question that you know I've had in my personal narrative of bit by bit coming to understand that my grandfather was an immigrant, which is something that I did not know until I was maybe in my 30s. Um, and that they very meticulously, very purposefully erased Latino culture <clears throat> from my family. Um, you know, no Spanish was spoken. And, and it's funny, my, my mother would call me Ed, Eduardo sometimes. And I was thought she was just being weird. But, um, but there, there's a, a whole, so a, a big part of it too is uh, an, the idea of coming to grips with an unseen heritage, with an unseen background, you know, the whole idea of the plague house, you know, okay, this is a house, you can move into it, but what's the heritage of this house? What's the heritage of this place? And what type of ownership do you have to take of that? Okay, thank you. Uh, there mm -hmm. is uh, another question, um, again, from uh, Timothy Joseph Ward. Uh, and the, the question is, did she ever get the Sancho Panza added? <laughs> That's great. Well, I, I, I'd like to think so. <laughs> I'd like to think she was very determined. So I'd like to think that she did go back with a handful of, of money that she made just to get that next ta next, next part of the, of the tattoo. Yes. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was rooting for her. <laughs> great. Um, well, and so I, I suppose that's it for our questions. Um, and thank you again for being with thank us you. this evening. Uh, oh we're so gosh. grateful. Thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed it. This has been absolutely wonderful. Highlight of autumn. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>